This past weekend, the evening of March 23rd to the evening of March 24th, marked the holiday of Purim for Jewish people worldwide. It's a holiday that was founded in the book of Esther. Now, God is not overtly mentioned anywhere in the book, but he's very present if we look carefully. And you probably already know what I'm going to say. The Hebrew gives us some interesting clues. So in honor of Purim, Today, we're going to examine the book of Esther for some cultural insights, learn about the basis of Purim, see what the Hebrew language reveals, and make an important correlation to the New Testament. Stay tuned for this episode of All Things Apostolic. The story of Esther is set during an era when the Persian Empire was dominant in the ancient Near East. The Persian Empire was founded by Cyrus the Great around 550 BC, and it became one of the largest empires in history. Persia was a global center of culture, science, art, and technology for more than 200 years. After Cyrus the Great conquered Babylon in 539 BC, the Jews became subjects of the Persian Empire. Although Cyrus issued a decree that allowed the Jewish people to return to their homeland, some chose to remain in Babylon and others moved even further east. The story of Esther takes place during the reign of King Ahasuerus. There is some scholarly debate as to which Persian king he was, but many or most believe that it was Xerxes. King Ahasuerus, that would be his Hebrew name, was searching for a new queen. Esther was an orphan being raised by her cousin Mordecai. Mordecai is identified as a Jew from the tribe of Benjamin, the son of Jer, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish. Kish was the name of Saul's father, and the name of Shimei was also associated with the house of Saul. It's possible that Mordecai was their descendant, or else he had relatives of the same names. But regardless, the writer includes the name of the tribe of Benjamin because it is a deliberate allusion to Saul. And Mordecai's enemy is a descendant of Saul's enemy, Agag. Haman is introduced in Esther chapter 3. Haman was an Agagite, so he was probably a descendant of Agag, king of the Amalekites, who were enemies of Israel. The Amalekites were descendants of Esau. They were nomadic people living in the desert between Egypt and Canaan. The Amalekites brutally attacked Israel unprovoked during the Exodus when Israel was traveling from Egypt to the Promised Land. In Deuteronomy chapter 25, Moses recounts Israel's treatment at the hand of the Amalekites. He said, Remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way when ye were come forth out of Egypt, how he met thee by the way and smote the hindmost of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee when thou wast faint and weary, and he feared not God. Therefore it shall be when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Thou shalt not forget it. There was ongoing animosity and violence between Israel and the Amalekites because the Amalekites repeatedly over the years attacked Israel. It was Saul's job to be God's arm of judgment against the Amalekites, but he did not do the job thoroughly, and his disobedience and rebellion led to God's rejection of him as king. The Amalekites continued to trouble Israel, including the episode in which they raided Ziklag, burned the village, and kidnapped the women and children. It was David and his men who defeated the Amalekites and rescued the hostages. The last mention of Amalekites is in the book of Esther with Haman the Agagite trying to annihilate the Jews in Persia. Haman hated Mordecai because Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor. 
And after Haman learned who Mordecai's people were, Haman wanted to destroy all of them throughout the entire kingdom. It was basically a plan for genocide. And the way the text is written, the author wants us to know that this was kind of like a rematch between Saul and Agag. So back to our story of Esther. I'm sure you're familiar with it, so I'm just going to briefly summarize it. Esther was taken along with a lot of other young maidens to be groomed and presented to the king so he could choose a new queen. And ultimately, he chose Esther. Meanwhile, Haman was elevated to a high position, and he used that position to convince the king to destroy a certain people group in the kingdom. In the presence of Haman, the poor, which is a Babylonian word for lot, was cast. Now, no one knows exactly how casting the poor was conducted. It could be that the lot was cast onto a surface that was divided into sections and marked with names of the months and the days. Another possibility is that lots with months and days already written on them were placed into a pouch and then shaken until one popped out. Now, the use of lots was considered a form of divination because it was believed that God affected the outcome. Once the date was determined and the decree was written, dispatches were sent by couriers to all of the provinces with the order to destroy, kill, and annihilate all of the Jews, young and old, women and children, and also to plunder their goods on a single day, the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar. Mordecai persuaded Esther to help. She agreed to visit the king, although she had not been summoned, and that would put her life at risk. She and her attendants and all of the Jews of Susa fasted for three days. Fasting is typically accompanied by prayer, so we can assume that they prayed as well, but there is no specific mention of prayer in the text. Esther needed to secure the favor of the king or risk being killed. At the second banquet, she made her request known to the king. After Haman's plot was uncovered, the king had Haman killed. He gave Haman's estate to Esther, and he gave Mordecai his signet ring. Now the original edict could not be undone, but Mordecai gave orders in the king's name and sealed it with his signet, saying that the Jewish people could assemble and protect themselves. They could destroy, kill, and annihilate anyone who attacked them or tried to plunder their goods. The Bible says that as a result, the Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor, and in every province and in every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day, and many of the people of the land became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. On the appointed day, the thirteenth day of the month of Adar, the Jewish people struck down their enemies. And on the 14th day, the Jewish people around the kingdom rested. It was a day of feasting and joy. But at Esther's request, the king gave the Jews in Susa an additional day to attack their enemies. So they rested and had a day of feasting and joy on the 15th day of the month. The Bible tells us that Mordecai recorded these events and he sent letters to all of the Jews throughout the provinces of Persia to have them celebrate annually the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar. As the days wherein the Jews rested from their enemies and the month which was turned unto them from sorrow to joy and from mourning into a good day, that they should make them days of feasting and joy and of sending portions one to another and gifts to the poor. Haman had cast the poor, the lot, in an attempt to destroy the Jews So the Jews called the celebration Purim, which is the plural form of Pur. And I just want to mention, too, that you may hear people pronounce it like Purim. And that's more of an English way to pronounce it. And that's totally fine, too. I learned it as Purim because that's the traditional Hebrew pronunciation. But you might hear it as Purim from some. 
Now the Bible says that the Jews ordained and took upon them and upon their seed and upon all such as joined themselves unto them, so as it should not fail that they would keep these two days according to their writing and according to their appointed time every year, and that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province, and every city, and that these days of Purim should not fail from among the Jews, nor the memorial of them perish from their seed. Today, Purim is still a joyous annual celebration. A feast is typically held on Purim Day, and the children and even some adults often dress up in masquerade costumes to commemorate Queen Esther hiding her Jewish identity. Other important aspects of the holiday include giving to the poor or to charity and giving gifts of food to friends. A common food is a delectable three-cornered pastry called hamantaschen. They are filled with poppy seeds or other fillings. The word haman, which is actually the Hebrew pronunciation of Haman, is haman. So haman can refer to the wicked Haman or to poppy seeds, man. And the Yiddish word tash means pocket. So hamantaschen could mean poppy seed filled pockets or Haman's pockets. The Jewish people read the book of Esther once on the evening when Purim begins and once on Purim day. When Haman's name is mentioned, it's customary to use noisemakers or simply stomp feet to essentially blot out his name so it can't be heard. Purim is a chance to celebrate the victory that God gave the Jews over their enemies. And it should not be trivialized. It is still relevant today because anti-Semitism is unfortunately still active and prevalent in some locations. Now, the book of Esther is unique for several reasons. First, the main character is a female, and the book is named after her. There's only one other book in the Old Testament like that, which is Ruth. Ruth was a Gentile who married a Jew, and Esther was a Jew who married a Gentile. Second, the story is set in the royal court of Persia. God had warned his people, that the, the Israelites, that if they forsook him, he would hide his face from them. And the exile was the fulfillment of God's warning. And Esther and Mordecai were living in the time of the diaspora, or the dispersion of the Jews out of their homeland to other parts of the world. Third, interestingly, the king's edict, as written by Mordecai, allowed the Jewish people not only the right to defend themselves and kill their enemies, but also to plunder the spoil of their enemies. It was basically a complete reversal of Haman's decree. However, multiple times the Bible mentions that the Jews did not lay their hands on the plunder. Was it because they didn't want to seem motivated by greed? Possibly. Or more likely, it stems from the view that this scenario between Mordecai and Haman was like a replay of the showdown between Saul and Agag, or between Israel and Amalek. If we think back to the situation with Saul, God had forbidden the Israelites from taking plunder from the Amalekites. And in this situation, although the Jews were given permission to take the plunder, they didn't. It was as if this was their chance to show their obedience to God. I also want to mention briefly about the historicity of Mordecai. Of course, the historicity of the whole book has been questioned by liberal and secular scholars. But specific to Mordecai, it has sometimes been questioned whether he existed. Could a Jewish man have been placed in such a prominent position in the Persian government? Well, the name Mordecai is an authentic personal name from this time period. It occurs in Aramaic documents as MRDK and in cuneiform tablets as Marduka or Marduka. And archaeologists have uncovered a cuneiform text dating from the last years of Darius I or the early years of Xerxes I. And the tablet mentions a certain government official or scribe named Marduka in the context of a list of payments made to Persian officials and their retainers. So the cuneiform text confirms the existence of a Persian royal official named Marduka, which could be Mordecai, engaged in a role that's consistent 
with the Bible's depiction of Mordecai's role. Now, of course, this is speculative, and there are scholars who counter that the evidence is insufficient, but it's still very interesting. Another interesting point is that the book of Esther is the only biblical book that makes no direct references to God. He's not mentioned at all. None of the general titles for God are included, such as Elohim, Shaddai, or Adonai. On the other hand, the Persian king is mentioned 192 times in 167 verses. His kingdom is referred to 26 times, and his name is mentioned 29 times. There is no mention of Jerusalem or the temple, the law, Moses, none of that, and no mention of God. Now, not only is much of ancient Near Eastern literature full of religious language, but so is the Hebrew Bible. So the lack of religious content is striking, and we can assume that it was certainly intentional by the writer. However, although God is not overtly mentioned, his presence and protection and providence are felt throughout the story. The king and his kingdom may have been mentioned numerous times, and the devil through Haman was working to exterminate the chosen people, but ultimately, it was God who was in control. He was working behind the scenes. Some believe that because his work was kind of secret, that therefore his name is hidden secretly in the book. It's not obvious in English, but it can be seen in the Hebrew Bible. Scholars point to five acrostics in the book of Esther. And an acrostic is when the initial letter of several usually consecutive words spell out a word. In the book of Esther, four times an acrostic spells out the personal name of God uh, using the tetragrammaton, which stands for Jehovah or Yahweh. So let's look at these four. Remember that Hebrew reads from right to left. At the top, you see the tetragrammaton. If it doesn't look familiar, you can go back and watch an episode from a few weeks ago that I did about the tetragrammaton. The letters are yod He vav He. The first example is from chapter 1, verse 20 of Esther. The tetragrammaton reads backwards with the initial letter. In the second example, from chapter 5, verse 4, the name reads right to left, with the initial letter. So in my mind, this is the clearest example. In the third acrostic in chapter five, verse 13, the name reads backward with the final letter of each word. And in the fourth example from chapter seven, verse seven, the name reads right to left with the final letter of each word. All four acrostics appear in four consecutive words. And there are quite, there are beyond this, a lot of patterns with these acrostics that would take too long to cover, but they do help to validate that this was intentional and not coincidental. So it's not just the acrostics, but there are also patterns of the relationship between these acrostics that also show an intentionality. The fifth acrostic is found in Esther chapter seven, verse five, and it is the word eye which means I am. It is a form of the verb to be. When God told Moses, I am that I am, in Exodus 3.14, he used the word eye. It is spelled with an olive he, yod he. And here you can see that it reads right to left with the final letter of each word. And in case it seems like someone is imagining this or reading something into the text that's unintentional, because sometimes that can happen with um, zealous or creative people who are, who are uh, examining the text, in at least three ancient manuscripts, the letters in all five of these acrostics are written larger than the other letters. So they were written to intentionally stand out. So people believe that the writer purposefully hid God's name in the text, just as God was kind of hidden by working behind the scenes and not overtly in the story of Esther. Now, like many of the other stories we've examined, it demonstrates that God is indeed in control of history. Of all the women in the empire, Esther was chosen to become queen. 
Mordecai happened to overhear a plot to kill the king, and he successfully protected the king's life. But it went unnoticed until exactly the right time. And on the most critical night of the story, the king couldn't sleep. And the story read to him was about Mordecai's service. Haman was forced to give Mordecai, the man he hated, a public display of honor. And after being caught, Haman was hanged on the gallows he had created for Mordecai. And the Jewish people throughout the empire were saved. These events and the specific timing of them are amazing and obviously no coincidence. Esther and Mordecai did their parts and showed obedience to God's principles. But God was the hero who showed that he always takes care of his own. So I want to spend the last few minutes and conclude with this thought. The story of Esther is important because it has implications for the New Testament. We can see types and shadows in the story. So sit back for a few minutes and listen to a summary of the story that highlights it a little different in a way that connects to the New Testament. Think of it this way. The king represents an unsaved person who is ignorant of God and very worldly. Mordecai ultimately saves the king, so he represents the savior. Haman is the enemy, and Esther is the one who knows and loves Mordecai, the savior, who later witnesses about the truth to her husband, the king. So I'm going to take a few moments and retell the story of Esther from this framework. The story opens with the king, who is ignorant of God and his need for salvation. He hosted a lavish feast, and he was full of worldly pride and seeking pleasure. After getting rid of his first wife, he held a beauty contest to get a new queen. Esther, a beautiful, young, pure Jewish woman, was taken to the palace and ended up being chosen as queen. But although she lived in a worldly environment, she still kept her love for Mordecai in her heart. He had saved her when she was orphaned. Then Mordecai provided salvation for the king when he reported to Esther about a plot against the king's life. Esther told the king about the plot and mentioned Mordecai to him as the one who provided him salvation. But the king ignored the message about Mordecai. After ignoring the savior, Haman was the enemy who was elevated to a powerful position. He hated Mordecai, and he hated Mordecai's people. After getting the king to sign a decree to annihilate the Jews, Mordecai talked to Esther to give her a conviction about taking action. But she eased her conscience by giving him a gift. But Mordecai was not appeased. Esther had to get involved and tell her husband the truth about what was happening. So she urged God's people to fast and then she would speak to her husband about the things of God. And once Esther followed the leading of the Savior, this opened the way for God to act in her husband's life. And it began that very night when the king couldn't sleep. And he commanded the court librarian to read to him. And of all of the documents in the library, he chose the account of Mordecai's role in saving the king from death. Mordecai's great work of salvation had not been forgotten because it had been written in a book. In the middle of the night, two unsaved men were sitting up and one man was reading to the other man about a savior and about salvation provided for him. The king's heart was pierced with conviction because he had done nothing to acknowledge the debt to the one who had provided salvation for him. And at that critical moment, Haman reappeared. Just as the king was about to make a decision, the enemy arrived. But the king wisely chose to acknowledge his debt to the Savior. And I like what John Philip says, Mordecai never intruded upon the king's sovereign right to decide how to respond to him as the Savior. God does not force his salvation upon us, even though he brings us face to face with the facts and with our need to respond. The story of salvation is always a blending of the supernatural and the simple, of divine sovereignty 
and the human right to decide. So after the king made a decision to acknowledge his debt to the Savior, Esther's task was then to reveal to him the truth about the enemy and how the enemy had been using him and manipulating him. After Haman was exposed, he was executed. But he wasn't hanged in a general sense. He was hanged on the gallows he had specifically built for Mordecai. So in a sense, besides being poetic justice, this shows a spiritual principle. God's answer to the enemy is a cross, but not just any cross. It has to be the cross of Christ. And after the enemy was dealt with, the king gave the signet ring to Mordecai, symbolizing that where the enemy had ruled, now the Savior ruled. And people noticed the difference. There was a change in the management of the king's affairs with the Savior in control of the king's affairs. The king used his influence to protect the people of God. God's people had joy and gladness, and many people were drawn to be part of the people of God. God instituted a feast so that the great work of salvation would not be forgotten. Similarly, the New Testament offers believers a feast of remembrance as the Lord's Supper. The story concludes with Mordecai's great work being written in a book. So I hope today's episode has given you a greater appreciation for the book of Esther. There is some New Testament truth hidden in an Old Testament story. And interestingly, the book of Esther is the last book of the historical section of the Old Testament. Looking back over all of that unfolding history of God's divine design and progressive revelation, we see his divine providence even in the darkest hours. Sometimes his presence is bold and spectacular, but other times it's subtle and almost hidden. But even behind the scenes, God still rules and reigns. <laughs>